morning. Welcome to the BibleTeam.com read-along program. Uh, this morning is uh, November 17th, and we can see in our reading plan here that we're following, November 17th is Ezekiel, if I can get it in focus, um, 16 and 17. So that's the chapters we're reading today. So we're following through the Old Testament for the year, and we're going to be concluding with Malachi sometime late December. So I'm just doing this once a week. I pick between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday as my day to do it. And um, it's it's straight from the hip. I don't plan these. I just decide to read whatever days today and read it, and then I talk about it. And so uh, my whole purpose is to encourage you to read along with me and to get uh, more out of, out of the scriptures. And what I like to do when I talk about it is somehow relate it to um, the New Testament, relate it to, to Jesus, the, the revealed Messiah that um, these people long to know. Um, these, you know, the people that lived in the Old Testament. So um, let's get started. Heavenly Father, we praise you. And we thank you for uh, this morning, for an opportunity to read your word. Lord, we ask that you open our hearts. Lord, we can't understand this without your help. And we know that um, you give us the ability to, uh, to understand. And Lord, we just want more understanding. We want to know you more. Uh, we want a clearer picture. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for leading you to begin with for opening our hearts, that we might truly know you. And so, Lord, we just ask that you bless our time together here this morning. We ask that you help us to uh, give you our un undivided attention right now, Lord, um, that we might um, get to know you more. And we praise you. We thank you for this new day, and we just ask you to bless our time. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 16 Then another message came to me from the Lord Son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable sins Give her this message from the sovereign Lord For you are nothing but a Canaanite Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite On the day you were born, no one cared about you Your umbilical cord was not cut, and you were never washed, rubbed with salt, and wrapped in cloth. No one had the slightest interest in you. No one pitied you or cared for you. On the day you were born, you were un unwanted, dumped in a field, and left to die. But I came by and saw you there, helplessly kicking about in your own blood. As you lay there, I said, Live. And I helped you to thrive like a plant in the field. You grew up and became a beautiful jewel. Your breasts became full and your body grew, body hair grew. But you were still naked. And when I passed by again, I saw that you were old enough for love. So I wrapped my cloak around you to cover your nakedness and declared my marriage vows. I made a covenant with you, says the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. Then I bathed you and washed off your blood, and I rubbed fragrant oils on your skin. I gave you expensive clothing of fine linen and silk, beautifully embroidered, and sandals made of fine goatskin leather. I gave you lovely jewelry, bracelets, beautiful necklaces a ring for your nose, earrings for your ears, and a lovely crown for your head. And so you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were made of fine linen and were beautifully embroidered. You ate the finest foods, choice flour, honey, and olive oil, and became more beautiful than ever. You looked like a queen, and so you were. Your fame soon spread throughout the world because of your beauty. I dressed you in 
my splendor and perfected your beauty, says the Sovereign Lord. But you thought your fame and beauty were your own. So you gave yourself as a prostitute to every man who came along. Your beauty was theirs for the asking. You used the lovely things I gave you to make shrines for idols where you played the prostitute. Unbelievable! How could you how could such a thing ever happen? You took the very jewels and gold and silver ornaments I had given you and made statues of men and worshipped them. This is adultery against me. You used the beautifully embroidered clothes I gave you to dress your idols. Then you used my special oil and my incense to worship them. Imagine it. You set before them as a sacrifice the choice flour, olive oil, and honey I'd given you, says the Sovereign Lord. Then you took your sons and daughters, the children you had borne to me, and sacrificed them to your gods. Was your prostitution not enough? Must you also slaughter my children by sacrificing them to idols? In all your years of adultery and detestable sin, you have not once remembered the days long ago when you lay naked in a field, kicking about in your own blood. What sorrow awaits you, says the Sovereign Lord. In addition to all your, all your other wickedness, you built a pagan shrine and put altars to idols in every town square. On every street corner you defiled your beauty, offering your body to every passerby in an endless stream of prostitution. Then you added lustful Egypt to your lovers, provoking my anger with your increasing promiscuity. That is why I struck you with my fist and reduced your boundaries. I handed you over to your enemies, the Philistines, and even they were shocked by your lewd conduct. You have prostituted yourself for the Assyrians, too. It seems you can never find enough new lovers. And after your prostitution there, you still were not satisfied. You added to your lovers by embracing Babylonia, the land of merchants. But you still weren't satisfied. What a sick heart you have, says the Sovereign Lord, to do such things as these, acting like a shameless prostitute. You build your pagan shrines on every street corner, and your altars to idols in every square. In fact, you have been worse than a prostitute, so eager for sin that you have not even demanded payment. Yes, you are an adulterous wife who takes in strangers instead of her own husband. Prostitutes charge for their services, but not you. You give gifts to your lovers, bribing them to come and have sex with you. But you are opposite. You are the opposite of other prostitutes. You pay your lovers instead of them paying you. Therefore, you prostitute, listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, Because you have poured out your lust and exposed yourself in prostitution to all your lovers, and because you have worshipped detestable idols, and because you have slaughtered your children as sacrifices to your gods, this is what I'm going to do. I will gather together all your allies, the lovers with whom you have sinned, both those you loved and those you hated, and I will strip you naked in front of them, so they can stare at you. I will punish you for your murder and adultery. I will cover you with blood in my jealous fury. Then I will give you to these many nations who are your lovers, and they will destroy you. They will knock down your pagan shrines and the altars to your idols. They will strip you and take your beautiful jewels, leaving you stark naked. They will band together in a mob to stone you and cut you up with swords. They will burn your homes and punish you in front of many women. I will stop your prostitution and end your payments to your many lovers. Then at last my fury against you will be spent and my jealous anger will subside. I will be calm and will not be angry with you anymore. But first, because you have re not remembered your youth but have angered me, 
by doing all these evil things, I will fully repay you for all, your, all of your sins, says the Sovereign Lord. For you have added lewd acts to all your detestable sins. Everyone who makes up Proverbs will say of you, like mother, like daughter, for your mother loathed her husband and her children, and so do you. And why? And you are exactly like your sisters, for they despise their husbands and their children. Truly your mother was a Hittite, and your father an Amorite. Your older sister was Samaria, who lived with her daughters in the north. Your younger sister was Sodom, who lived with her daughters in the south. But you have not merely sinned as they did. You quickly surpass them in corruption. Surely, as surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, Sodom and her daughters were never as wicked as you and your daughters. Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. She was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out, as you have seen. Even Samaria did not commit half your sins. You have done far more detestable things than your sisters ever did. They seem righteous compared to you. Shame on you. Your sins are so terrible that you make your sisters seem righteous even virtuous. But someday I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and Samaria, and I will restore you too. Then you will be truly ashamed of everything you have done, for your sins make them feel good in comparison. Yes, your sisters, Sodom and Samaria, and all their people will be restored, and at that time you, will, you also will be restored. In your proud days you held Sodom in contempt, but now your greater wickedness has been exposed to all the world, and you are the one who is scorned by Edom and all her neighbors, and by Phil Philistia. This is your punishment for all your lewdness and detestable sins, says the Lord. Now this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I will give you what you deserve, for you have taken your solemn vows lightly by breaking your covenant. Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you when you were young, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember with shame all the evil you have done. I will make your sisters Samaria and Sodom to be your daughters, even though they are not part of our covenant. And I will reaffirm my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. You will remember your sins and cover your mouth in silent shame when I forgive you of all that you have done, I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Ezekiel chapter 17 Then this message came to me from the Lord, Son of man, give this riddle and tell this story to my people of Israel. Give them this message from the Sovereign Lord. A great eagle with broad wings and long feathers, covered with many cumulative covered with many colored plumage, came to Lebanon. He seized the top of a cedar tree and plucked off its highest branch. He carried it away to a city filled with merchants. He planted it in a city of traders. He also took a seedling from the land and planted it in fertile soil. He placed it beside a broad river where it could grow like a willow tree. It took root there and grew into a low spreading vine. Its branches turned up toward the eagle and its roots grew down into the ground. It produced strong branches and put out shoots. But then another great eagle came with broad wings and full plumage. So the vine now sent its roots and branches toward him for water. Even though it was already planted in good soil and had plenty of water, so it could grow into a splendid vine and produce rich leaves and luscious fruit. So now the Sovereign Lord asks, will this vine grow and prosper? No, I will pull, up, I will pull it up, roots and all. I will cut off its fruit and let its leaves wither and die. I will pull it up easily, without a strong, 
a strong arm or a large army. But when the vine is transplanted, will it thrive? No, it will wither away. When the east wind blows against it, it will die in the same good soil where it had grown so well. Then this message came to me from the Lord. Say to these rebels of Israel, Don't you understand the meaning of this riddle of the eagles? The king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took away her king and princes, and brought them to Babylon. He made a treaty with a, with a member of the royal family and forced him to take an oath of loyalty. He also exiled Israel's most influential leaders, so Israel would not become strong again in revolt. Only by keeping her treaty with Babylon could Israel survive. Nevertheless, this man of Israel's royal family rebelled against Babylon, sending ambassadors to Egypt and to request a great army and many horses. Can Israel break her sworn treaties like that and get away with it? No, for as surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, the King of Israel will die in Babylon, the land of the king who put him in power and whose treaty he disregarded and broke. Pharaoh and all his mighty army will fail to help Israel when the king of Babylon lays siege to Jerusalem again and destroys many lives. For the king of Israel disregarded his treaty and broke it after swearing to obey. Therefore he will not escape. So this is what the Sovereign Lord says, As surely as I live, I will punish him for breaking my covenant and disregarding the solemn oath he made in my name. I will throw my net over him and capture him in my snare. I will bring him to Babylon and put him on trial for this treason against me. And all his best warriors will be killed in battle. And those who survive will be scattered to the four winds. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take a branch from the top of a tall cedar, and I will plant it on the top of Israel's highest mountain. It will become a majestic, majestic cedar, sending forth its branches and producing seed. Birds of every sort will nest in it, finding shelter in the shade of its branches. And all the trees will know that it is I, the Lord, who cuts the tall tree down and makes the short tree grow, grow tall. It is I who makes the green tree wither and gives the dead tree new life. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do what I said. Amen. Okay, so it took us a little less than 18 minutes. Ezekiel 16 has been by far the longest chapter so far in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel is 48 uh, chapters, and um, so far they've been relatively short. So that was a long chapter. Um, in what detail uh, we read about um, Jerusalem being compared to a, an adulterous, promiscuous wife. Um, you know, the Bible, um, if we consider all of Scripture, there's much to be said about um, God um, using um, marriage as an analogy as his relationship with us. Um, many times throughout the Old Testament, God talks about his covenant. He established his covenant in Deuteronomy with the people. It wasn't a covenant that the Israelites um, went into blindly. Um, if you read Deuteronomy, which is such a, a foundational book, um, it makes it really clear. As a matter of fact, it, it started in Exodus, but those you know, first five books, we see how this nation, Israel, started. And um, if you go along with us, we're going to start the Old Testament all over again in January. And, um, and it's very exciting when, you know, when you read those first five books. It's, to me, it's, it's a beautiful story. And it's how God took out of, you know, one man, Abraham, and um, started the whole nation to begin with. And, and how he brings them out of Egypt. 
uh, miraculously, of course, through you know the parting of the the Red Sea and you know the ten plagues even before that. Um, anyway, um, he he took them from nothing. You know, starting out as Abraham, and um, here he's talking about how you know he found her in a field, kicking in its own blood, and it's so graphic, and um, it it's just I don't know I think it's it's really pretty cool uh, to me I um, and 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 then how you know we we read on in the Old Testament about how God you know, gave them the, the promised land after the covenant. And, and the covenant, again, is something that um, it, the Israelites went in wise, eyes wide open. Um, they knew exactly what they were signing up for. They agreed to obey. They agreed to all the uh, conditions that God put. So, so right here, um, through Ezekiel, God's giving this message and saying, look, um, you know, we had this covenant. You became my bride. And look how unfaithful, how promiscuous you've been. So if you read throughout um, in the historical books, which are, which are essential to understand all this, because we learn about how the kings became these prostitutes, how they um, forgot about God, so they, they turned away from their, their groom in God who has given them everything, gave them life, and gave them all their providence, all, all the good things that he's taken care of them with. He, the, the kings turned to um, the Philistines, they turned to Egypt, they turned to Assyria, um, they turned to Syria, they turned to all these um, nations for help and for treaties and um and you know they're they were to be the beacon the light that god used as you know uh, like a you know a message and david understood this david understood that um the, the the purpose of of god establishing israel as a great nation and they were a great nation um where people looked to them in awe you remember the envoy of Queen of Sheba coming to meet with with Solomon, and, and Solomon was the beginning of the end, actually, because of because of what Solomon did, because of his unfaithfulness that started with all those wives where he went crazy. It seemed to be after his temple project and and everything he built, he he just went downhill from that. And we we see how. Um, God gave them such a great nation and because of David um, God just blessed them um, unbelievably with wealth and a wise king and all in that generation it went from being you know the chosen people that were blessed with everything to the end of it where God decided to tear you know ten tribes out of out of uh, you know the, the Judah's uh, reign, the reign of uh, the king of Judah. Uh, so that's where you get the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, th this is just the culmination of all that. That's how it all started, and we see king after king after king being unfaithful. Yes, there were some good kings in there, but ultimately, um, between the the king and the prophets and the priests, um, the whole leadership of Israel failed. The leadership led their people astray. And um, we, we've talked about leadership in the last uh, week where um, God blames the, the leadership, you know, that fails to follow God. And, and the whole people of the nation pay for that. They're all, and, and, and it's not like the people are innocent. People are not innocent by all means. But the leaders have the greater responsibility, and the weight is put more on the leaders than it is on the people. So we read about how, um, you know, on and on, what sorrow awaits you in verse 23, says the Sovereign Lord, in addition to all your other wickedness, you built a pagan shrine, built a pagan shrine, and 
put altars to idols in every town square. So above and beyond, um, the Israelites trusting in other nations, they they took to other gods. And again, you know, it started with Solomon and his all his wives. Solomon worshipped other gods, and that's just to me, it's unbelievable. It was really unbelievable how Solomon could have done that in his own lifetime. He talked to God himself. He, um, you know, was. God came to him and asked him, you know, what he really wanted. Remember, and he said he wanted wisdom to, to rule his people. So he really got off to a great start. And it was all because of his lust that he later um, took on all these wives, and um, they they drew him away from God. So, you know, what's really fascinating here is what happened in the physical sense. What happened in 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 yeah the physical. In actuality, were Solomon taking on many wives? That's eventually what happened as the nation of Israel. So you you could mirror Solomon in his his life with the nation of Israel. It's the same thing. They got off to a great start, and they, they took off on all these wives. And it was every wife, but um, or it was every husband. I'm sorry, they took on all these husbands. So it's a little, it's 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 not a straight analogy. You know, you have uh, Solomon and all his wives, but you have um, Israel is to be, you know, the bride of God. And um, and they took on all these other uh, men. That's how, how, you know, that's the picture we're given here. So, um, you know, but, but, you know, so there's a lot of similarities there. I'll just say that. Um, anyway, um, and then and then he goes on to talk about, um, uh, he compares them to Samaria and, and Syria. Are Samaria and Sodom, and he says they're even worse than the people of Sodom. You know, the thing is about Sodom is um, they never re really had a chance to repent. Um, no one came to them as uh, as Jonah visited the Ninevites, because you know even uh, Jesus in you know Jesus says you know if Sodom had witnessed these things, they would have repented. And, um, you know, I think everybody in Sodom is, you know, many will probably be, you know, destroyed or, or t eternally, but maybe some are innocent. We know that, you know, he didn't find ten righteous people in Sodom. So, anyway, um, Jesus said that Sodom would have repented had they been given a chance. So, anyway... Um, he he continues to tell them that um, uh, you know in verse fifty one even Samaria did not commit half your sins you have done far more detestable things than your sisters ever did they seem righteous compared to you shame on you your sins are so terrible that you make your sisters seem righteous even virtuous okay but here's the hope always usually always in these um usually always that's uh, oxymoron isn't it um, in most cases, when you hear um, a judgment from the Lord, you always have a silver lining, some hope at the tail end of it. And here it is in verse 53. This is no different. Um, but someday I will restore the fortunes of Sodom and Samaria, and I will restore you too. Now, I don't know how he's going to restore the fortunes of Sodom, or Samaria for that matter. Um, and Samaria was um, the capital city of the northern kingdom, by the way. So he's comparing them to um, the, the, you know, sisters, and actually they were the fellow Israelites. Then you will truly be ashamed of everything you have done for your sins. Make them feel good in comparison. So he's saying that um, he's going to restore, restore them. Um, Yet I will remember the covenant I made with you when you were young, in verse 60. And I will re establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember with shame all your evil you have done. I will make your sisters Samaria and Sodom to be your daughters, even though they are not part of our covenant. And this stuff, I have no idea when that's going to happen. I, <laughs> I don't think it's happened yet. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't know how we'd know that. But I, I, I think it will. I think it's yet to be seen. I think a lot of this is, is in our future. 
because I don't I don't think there's anything that happened that that could claim that you know this has already happened. Um, you will remember your sins and cover your mouth in silent shame when I forgive you of all that you have done. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. Okay, so that wraps up Ezekiel 16. Um, such imagery throughout the whole uh, chapter about you know the, com com the comparison between God's relationship with uh, Israel and, and a man and a wife, and then the story of the eagles. Um, he he explains this. It's a riddle from verses 1, th or actually the riddle starts in verse 3, and it runs through verse 10, and then he uses the rest of the chapter to explain the riddle. Um, you know, in verse 12 it says, Don't you understand the meaning of this riddle of the eagles? Um, and um, he's talking about, I, I believe he's talking about King Zedekiah. King Zedekiah is uh, one of the last kings. I think I think he was the last king on the throne. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Jehoiachin before him. That um, he was the first king to be exiled. So what happened was the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, came and took King Jehoiachin back to Babylon as an exile, and then he placed Zedekiah on the throne. I am pretty sure Zedekiah is not his true name, but the king of Babylon gave him the name Zedekiah. I'm almost certain this, and I'm not really sure how I know that. But he he wasn't really in direct line. He's like an uncle of Jehoiachin, or something like that. I think it's in the tail end of Second Chronicles. You can read about that. So Zedekiah, um, he made an oath. He swore in a covenant to uh, Nebuchadnezzar that he was going to stay faithful to Babylon. And um, at that time, I don't think Babylon had any greater plans or more plans to exile and destroy the nation. I don't think they were planning on, um, you know, the demolition that happened. Uh, but what happened was, and it says here, that Zedekiah, although he gave his word to the king of Babylon, the king of Babylon, remember, this is not just some um, Gentile heathen country. I mean, they are, but in this, in 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 this event, um, they become the executioners, the um, the police force of the Lord, because it says many times in the Old Testament that Nebuchadnezzar was a servant of God, and he, you know, of course Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand that, he didn't see that as as he did this, but God used Nebuchadnezzar and his mighty army to attack Jerusalem and siege it, laid, it, laid siege to it. Um, so they were working on behalf of God. So um, that meant that Zedekiah, you know, when he made that that oath to Babylon, it was like, you know, making an oath with God. So, um, and, and, and this, this riddle backs it up. Um, it says, God took it personally. Uh, verse 15, Nevertheless, this man of Israel's royal family rebelled against Babylon, sending ambassadors to Egypt to request a great army and many horses. So, he, you know, Zedekiah wanted to get out of his deal. He wanted to go back on his word. And, you know, he didn't understand, and he should have understood because Jeremiah told him, we read that in Jeremiah, Jeremiah had um, personal con you know, confrontations with Zedekiah. Zedekiah wanted to hear the truth, and um, Jeremiah gave him the truth, and he, he didn't go with it. Instead, he decided to seek help from Egypt to get out of it. Remember, Zed uh, Jeremiah told him to surrender. Jeremiah told him you know, to, to go along with what's going on. And... Um, this is after Zedekiah broke the oath, and, and Jeremiah still tells him that all will go well with him if he, you know, surrenders. But he chose not to. Even after that, he um, he tries to escape, gets caught, and so um, it says, uh, "Can Israel?" In verse fifteen, it says, "Can Israel break her sworn treaties like that and get away with it? No, for as surely as I live, 
says the sovereign Lord, the king of Israel will die in Babylon, the, the land of the king who put him in power and whose treaty he disregarded and broke. So there you have it. Zedekiah wasn't the natural um, heir to the throne. Um, he was put in the power by the king of Babylon and he broke that treaty that he made. Pharaoh and all his mighty men will fail to help Israel when the king of Babylon lays siege to Jerusalem again and destroys many lives. Okay, so um, that's the tale of the eagles. I don't completely understand the riddle, but clearly, you know, it's it's about Zedekiah and his... And, and, and ultimately, uh, the Lord is asserting his sovereignty here. That although a plant is planted in fertile soil, um, it, it he, the Lord gives it um, strength to survive and makes it prosper. And ultimately, a plant that's not planted in, in fertile soil, ultimately the Lord can make it prosper. So the Lord has that power to do that. He does the power to defy our laws of physics, um, as he does in miracles, of course. Um, so this is basically that although this happened, you know, he, um, he says at the end, I love this, and all the trees will know that it is I, the, the Lord who cuts the tall tree down and makes the short tree short tree grow tall. It is I who makes the green tree wither and gives the dead tree new life. I, the Lord, have spoken and I will do what I said. In much the same way, he, um, he gave Israel new life in 1948 after World War II. Um, God had um, the United Nations declare that the Israelites go back to their home. And that was not, um, that was nothing short, my friends, of a miracle. No one ever thought that it was ever ha going to happen, but the Bible did. The Bible said it was going to happen. So, um, in, in God's eyes, He it's all under His, um, it's all His doing. It was nothing short of a miracle. So, my friends, to compare this to our lives today, um, God wants um, a relationship with you, and He wants you to repent and turn to Him. So, uh, in doing so, we give our life to Him. So you can establish your own covenant with God today and say, Lord, I'm on board. I, I give in. I repent. I give my life to you. And I will do as you say. And, um, and you know what? God is faithful. He's patient. He's loving. Um, and yes, he does have wrath. Yes, he can get angry. And um, knowing that should give us a greater reverence for him that our life is in his hands and and we know from Jesus Christ that God is a great merciful God we are under a new covenant and it's based on our relationship with him it's because of our faith that we are saved because of what we read in Genesis and Abraham's life you can read that all throughout the New Testament that it is based on our faith in God and he wants this relationship and we as a church Church simply means body of Christ. That means we are um, we are the bride of Christ. So as Israel was a bride to God, as it says here in Ezekiel, we as a church are a bride to Christ, and um, and so we're compared in much the same way in the New Testament as Israel is compared um, in the Old Testament to to God. That we are. Um, his wife and we need to be faithful and loyal to God and live for him he's done so much for us he's given me a new life I am a new creature because of what Jesus has done in my life I'm not the same person I was before that's in the past now I'm looking forward to what God has in store for me and um, that's what I want for you that you might know him uh, and know him as a lover because he loves you and he wants you to love him back um, so I'll just stop there. So know that um, just as God gives new life to dead trees, um, He gives new life to dead people. Because before God, we are dead. We're dead in our sins. And only Jesus, only because of what Jesus did on the cross, can give us new life. And um, I just want to wish you a, a great day. And I pray, Lord, that, that you... Um, Continue seeking God and continue getting to know Him. Continue getting in this book. Follow along with me. And if you have any questions or anything, any prayer requests, please feel free to email me. Um, God bless you. Have a great day. Dear Father, 
in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for your mighty truth. We thank you for your beautiful word that you've given us this morning. Thank you for any understanding we have, Lord, that we might just cling to that and build on that knowledge, that we might just know you more. And um, I just thank you for the passion you've given me. And I just want that for everyone, Lord, that they have a passion for serving you, a passion for living for you, Lord, that they might truly pour out their life as an offering to you. In, in service to you, in service to others. In, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.